My dearest sister Liza, it has been rough these last weeks, so much so that only now I can write to you about what has happened after we set foot on these odd, mercurial shores. Strange things, wonderful things, terrible things. As you know, I took these men and women out to sea to forge a better life than we could scrape together behind on the mainland. Almost a hundred of us. We could barely fit on the two ships we scrounged together. Some of us had to sleep atop our own supplies, or alongside what little livestock we could take. But I digress. I write to you, and to my nieces and nephew, about our journey so far. On the first day, we struck a tent. From the wood we brought to that which we felled, we were well on our way to establishing a hold along the grassy shore of this odd place our cousin discovered. But we needed a central locale to gather, to talk, eat, and rest. So those amidst us who could sew took all our extra tents and fabric to stitch together the biggest cloth hovel you ever seen. More than 20 people could rest comfortably around the fire pit we dug in the middle. It was enough to rally around, and I equate many of the smiles on that first evening to the sight of that patchwork hilarity. But it held against the wind, the night, and the somber merriment we indulged in. Let me tell you, Liza, and Theo, if he's in the room with you, the penny-pinching scoundrel, that starting life anew is not as easy as many records would have you believe. But there is something quite special about sharing a meal with your community on a star-strewn night, using nothing but the things you could scrape together with your bare hands. There's only so much I can thank this journey for, and that is one thing. On the second day, we tamed the soil. As luck had it, we hit land just in time to plant crops before the season was out. There was no time to lose. By the way we deliberated and organized the operation, you'd think we were going to war. Hindsight struck and we realized we didn't bring near enough work animals to pull the plows. So the Mossfelt twins had to yank along one while someone steered it from the back. Oh, it was a disaster, Liza, but one that had its fair share of laughs. Trying to teach some of the kids who came with us was like trying to hold on to fish who developed tendencies to wander off mid-conversation. Eventually they got it, but not without a few stragglers shedding their duties like snakeskin. But our issues with that would soon be lifted off our shoulders because on the third day there came help. From the woods of all places, if you can believe it. All thanks to some of those dutiful delinquents, I suppose, but they stumbled upon a strange creature in the woods. It bore antlers like an elk, but its body was stout and strong. Legs thick with muscle, but light as a summer breeze. It played with the young'uns before joining them back home with us. You should have seen the look on Miss Abigail's face when they trotted into camp with these creatures trailing behind them. The rest of us were right shocked too, but in short order, we found there was nothing frightening about these beasts. In fact, they proved immeasurably helpful. They could pull the plows and wood sleds with ease, and they seemed more than happy to play with the kids. Only time would tell if they were to be truly trusted, but at the time we needed any assistance we could afford. And how could we say no to those wide-eyed, pleading faces? I'll tell you, Lizzie, that if you were in my shoes, you'd tag and name each of those horn helpers you would. With the crops planted and the carpenters laying scaffold for the houses, you'd think there'd be nothing more to worry about. But you'd be wrong, because on the fourth day, we had a visitor. A woman, native to the island, from what we gathered. She came to us in the morning, offering sweet fruit from the forest. Berries, melons, even some honey. We thanked her and offered some goods in return, or at least to repair her hewn clothes. In tatters they were, Liza. Tatters! And she wore no shoes! Surely she'd take some shoes. But she was adamant and refused our gifts, instead offering to help us. She would teach us how to care for the lands and the strange creatures that have taken a liking to us. Territor, she called them. Zorsha was her name, and she educated us that the beasts are sacred to the land, and that we should never see they are harmed under our care, or worse still, slaughtered for meat. Albrandt, or Butcher, scoffed at this, as did young Terry Boundbarrel. He acted as a scout and self-proclaimed Huntsmaster, even though we didn't have that title, nor was it one necessary to fill. Zorsha didn't take kindly to them, and neither did the rest of us, as a matter of fact. 
Last thing you want to do is agitate your neighbors. You could learn a thing about that spout of wisdom, Theo. I sent Albrand and Terry away, while the rest of us conversed with Zorsha well into the evening. She told us of places that we could gather or hunt safely, and those we could not. She foretold us of dire consequences should we ignore her warnings. Portents of angry nature spirits. Many among us were skeptical, and I'd do good to admit myself among them, but we all agreed to stay away. And there was one last thing before she left that night. She pulled me aside and whispered of a hidden area, a naturally forming altar that we were to steer clear of at all costs. Thinking she thought the fewer who knew it the better, I promised to keep it a secret and to steer our efforts clear. Pleased by my promise, she faded into the woodlands. Just in time as well, because at dawn on the fifth day, a storm brewed. It simmered over the horizon like a terrible stew of trouble. We all felt it, smelled it on the wind. We hurried to tie down anything that was loose. Thank heavens we brought enough rope. You never guess how much we use on our crops alone, but we had to make doubly sure they were covered in tarp, lest our efforts were for naught and our first sowing ruined. All of us here have dealt with bad weather before, but there was something maniacal about the gales gusting in, the way it howled over the treetops. How it sang as it weaved through the tall grass made me think for the first time, but not the last, that we were not welcome here. Ridiculous, I know, that I'd be intimidated by some above-average squall, but it threatened us, and, more importantly, our precious tent! We debated about taking it down, but we rejected it out of principle, of pride. We would not bend to the will of this land. We reinforced the tent with as much rope and wood as we could spare, and once the rest of the preparations were made, we hunkered down. We even sheltered the territories, if they needed it. Surely they were accustomed to the local weather, but better safe than sorry. All through the night, rains pelted us. Winds tore at our tents, trying to rip us up like some giant plucking carrots from the earth. But we held. We endured. By noon on the sixth day, the sun came out. We suffered some losses in our stockpile, but thankfully everyone made it okay, our new antlered friends included. Some of our crops were ruined, but the majority came through, and it was hardly an effort to replant the damages. With skies clearing, we decided next to rush a hall to store supplies. All able bodies that could wield an axe or saw strode to the forest en masse, and those who stayed behind worked on our first building. It would be grander than time should have allowed for overlooking the wide shoreline where the tents would eventually be replaced with proper hearths. That would be some time off. The day was filled with the smell of sweat and the song of labor. Colburn Sr. gave crash courses in woodwork so that we might rush the process. You can't rush perfection, but when you don't care much for it, you'd be surprised how fast you can work. Come dusk, we had four walls and most of the roof. Supplies were hauled indoors, stored and secured, with plenty of space for the rest of us to lounge. During the seventh day, we held a feast. Oh, Liza, let me tell you how it started. Myself and Miss Abigail began to imagine a holiday celebration for our first week on the new land. Word spread, and since we did not have the vitals to spare from our seeding amount, many of us ventured into the wilderness to gather it from nature making doubly sure not to disturb the sacred grounds that Zorsha told us about. I myself had the duty of steering those who wandered too far off track, getting dangerously close to that sacred grotto. Many came back with berries of all kinds, which Abigail and the young'uns quickly processed into jam. The moss felts procured exotic herbs and Mr. Delaney whipped up enough grain to cook heavy flatbreads. But the biggest catch by far was from Terry Boundbarrow. He tracked and caught biggest deer I'd ever seen. Most of us thought it was a boar at first, but Albrind assured us that its meat was venison and the butchered pelt belonged to a deer. Sadly, the pelt was deemed unsalvageable, but the meat was more than enough for the entire colony. When evening came, so too did the heavenly smells of sizzling roast and baked grain. We all managed to fit in and around our stockpile, passing portions of the tantalizing meat around. It was the most succulent, Flavorful cut I've ever had the pleasure of chewing. If only I could have included some in this letter as smoked jerky, 
but we ate it all. Terry relished the many pats on the back he got, and so did Abigail and Delaney. There was merriment well into the night, far after the cooking fire was snuffed. Now, Liza, I implore that if you are currently reading this to your children, that you pause and let them leave the room. Tell them all as well, then continue. If you are alone, then I will tell you what happened next. Come morning of the eighth day, we were judged. Zorsha erupted from the woods in a parade of anguish. She cursed us, called us liars. We didn't know what she meant. We tried to calm her down, but she was adamant in her accusations and called out one last time as she went back into the forest. We killed a terator and feasted on its flesh. All of us were stunned. We convened our council to discuss what she could mean, and the more we deliberated the matter, the more clear it became. It was Terry. The meat we gluttoned on was Terator, which he slain and disguised as a mangled deer. Albrent was in on it as well. We had a right mind to exile them then and there, but other issues reached our ears. The stumps of trees we felled sprouted verdant pods, bulbous things that writhed occasionally. Another storm swirled around the island overhead. Whatever nature spirits Zorsha warned us about grew angry at our insolence, ready to take revenge from our oblivious sin. We came to the conclusion that the spirits want recompense, and decided on an offering we can try to give. We never had the chance to, however. On the ninth day, the bowels attacked. In the middle of the night, the pods burst and let loose flurries of sentient limbs. The sounds they made, Liza, ugh, it was terrible. Skin crawling cracks of moving wood, accompanied by swarms of voracious insects that loved nothing more than to irritate us, latching and pulling on exposed skin while the branch amalgamations did their job. They didn't attack us directly, you see, but our supplies. They tore up our planted seeds, tipped our crates of preserves, smashed our jars, let loose the chickens and pigs. It was far too late for us to retaliate, but we did so regardless. Colbrin led the charge with his woodworking tools, Mosfelt's directly behind. Carved up a storm, they did. Took out plenty. Most others did their best to help or at least hinder the assault. But the final aggravation was near dawn. One of the devilish blighters stole a torch and took it upon our precious tent. The agony it was to watch it, Liza. Our tent torched the cinders. Once we dealt with the remainders, we gathered and wept. Our work undone in mere hours, with more to come judging by how the dawn light filtered through the gray clouds. We quickly convened and thought of seeking out Zorsha. Perhaps there was something we could do, anything, to undo our transgression. And that's where the final part of our first days came to an end, dear sister. Before the tenth day came, I made a choice. One I'll regret till the end of my days. Come noon, we set out to find Zorsha. We went in small groups to get better lay of the land. Terry and the Mosfelts were with me, and we explored the eastern fringes of the isle. Roots shifted in our way as if to bar entry to the elder arbors. Sunlight came and dimmed, and still there was no sign of the druid. That's when I had an idea. A grim epiphany. Unbeworst to the others, we were close to the altar Zorsha warned me about. I gave the order to split up. The Mosfelts would head west and reconvene with the others, while Terry and myself trudged north. None suspected what would happen. It took till evening, but we found it. A slab of rough, natural stone amidst a choking grove. Streams flowed outward, uphill. Air was thick with ancient powers that I promised myself never to tingle with again. Terry was awestruck as we approached the center. He never heard me take out my knife. Dear Liza, I... I confess my wrongdoing to you, and only you in the vain hope that you will keep it secret, and my soul might not be weighed in lead. I thought that the land would spare us if we gave it the blood of that who originally wronged it. Worst part was, I was right. Leaving out the exact details of what transpired on that altar, the air cleared. Roots lay still. Natural sounds came back to the forest. It was difficult to present myself to the rest of the colony, 
grateful as they were that everything settled down. Many asked where Terry was. Some already had suspicions, but kept their eyes earthbound. There was still much work to be redone, but the storm no longer loomed over our heads. Zorsha has not been spotted since. We redoubled our efforts to recover what was destroyed and replanted our crops. Several shelters have started to take shape now, and general thought is we will have enough food to survive the winter. We still have the Territors, oddly enough. They did not run away even when the woods attacked, and they appear reluctant to leave the children, who still play with them. Might this be a test? To see if we really could live in tandem with whatever force oversees this island? If that is the case, Liza, then we will be vigilant on their health and make sure that none taste their flesh again, delicious as it might be. My hand grows as weary as my heart, sister, so this letter might be the first and last I send till snow melt next year. Until then, I wish you and your family well in trying times, and perhaps you will learn better than some to follow the advice of your neighbors. <laughs>